Great. Uh, thank you all for attending. It seems pretty crowded in here, so that uh, probably means the topic is interesting. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here to talk to you today. My name is Dominic Perini. I'm a scalability architect uh, and a tech uh, lead uh, at the uh, London headquarter of Erlang Solutions. Uh, Erlang Solutions is a company that uh, uh, started operating when Erlang language uh, uh, became open source. And uh, since then, uh, has engaged in a number of activities uh, mainly uh, aimed at supporting other businesses, but also other activities related to developing internal products. So obviously I'm going to talk about uh, Erlang and uh, I also mentioned briefly Elixir. And uh, please, uh, uh, if you have any questions, uh, interrupt me. I'm, I'm not the kind of uh, person that gets pissed off uh, if uh, I cannot have my monologue until the end. So just interrupt me with questions, is they are welcome. So um, let's get started. So the first interesting uh, slide that we got here is uh, about WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp, I, I don't think it needs to be introduced. It's a massively scaled uh, uh, application out there written in airline. At least the server side of it is written in Erlang. Uh, it reached uh, uh, recently the threshold of 1 billion users. It's got uh, 50 engineers to support uh, the development side, the engineering side of it. So it's uh, by itself, it's an impressive uh, sort of achievement. <coughs> and uh, alongside with that, we had recently uh, in our uh, London uh, uh, Erlang user group, uh, we invited uh, uh, some uh, VP developers from uh, Goldman Sachs, who also in illustrated some of their internal uh, use of Erlang, obviously to an extent, because uh, only to an extent, because they want to keep it pretty secret what they do inside there. But it's interesting, they claim to have uh, um, a system running on 4,000 uh, nodes, Erlang nodes, machines, servers, um, and they are based on a, a React Core technology. React Core is a, a Basho developed technology uh, designed to support the database React, and uh, it's uh, effectively a copy of uh, um, the Dynamo uh, ring of hashes, and it's used for distributing uh, hashes in a cluster and uh, is designed to be uh, not only fault tolerant but also highly available. So that's an, uh, another interesting feature. So we come to as an estimate for WhatsApp. We didn't, uh, we don't really have uh, 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 the exact numbers, but they estimate that they are running at, at present on 600 to 700 servers. So, which is uh, um, also quite uh, an effort, quite uh, interesting. So let's move. There's an interesting event coming up uh, soon in March in San Francisco. <coughs> and this event will be primarily focused on Erlang and also on Elixir. There's a number of uh, participants, as you can see. And, uh, and uh, yes. And uh, how about the origin of the language? So the origin comes from uh, telecommunication applications. So here we see uh, a slide that presents how things were in, in, uh, designed in the past. So they were uh, pretty much uh, vertically scalable systems that are run separately. Now it's, uh, the focus is primarily on horizontal scaling. And uh, everything gets uh, hooked into a uh, backbone network where the, the number of servers uh, uh, cooperating and there's uh, access to these servers. So when we uh, come to these uh, systems, what uh, is nice to achieve uh, is to deal with the complexity, provide a no downtime, 
uh, provide a very scalable solution, a, a solution that is maintainable and distributed. This uh, often meets a, a very restricting uh, constraint, which is uh, the time to market. So it's uh, easy to achieve all that, but uh, there's also uh, the requirement to push it out in production pretty quickly. So that's when Erlang uh, proved to be a good tool. Uh, and it's uh, used by a number of uh, people that come from a functional programming background, and not only. Uh, some, uh, uh, some people use uh, RabbitMQ without perhaps realizing that there's Erlang on the back of it. So, um, it's a very nice tool in terms of interfacing with other languages, and it is the most uh, um, yeah, distributed, I mean, the most uh, used tool based on Erlang out there. Um, yes, uh, the, this uh, shows uh, uh, where it comes from in terms of uh, languages that uh, influence the design of uh, Erlang. <coughs> so there are uh, languages like uh, small talk, uh, other, uh, or functional languages like Miranda or ML. Obviously, from Miranda, there's also an evolution that uh, led to Haskell. <laughs> or, and it's also influenced by uh, logical languages like Prolog. So um, before I continue, um, I would like to say what Erlang is very good at and what is not good at. So it's very good at distributing, uh, at providing largely distributed services, massively distributed services. It's very good at providing uh, fault-tolerant uh, uh, systems, and I will explain during this talk why. Um, what is not good is uh, in achieving uh, number crunching uh, performance. So uh, it is. Uh, Pretty fast, but not as fast, of course, uh, as uh, C++ for specific uh, applications that are CPU intensive. And uh, another thing is not particularly good at is uh, <coughs> designing GUIs. So there are better languages out there if you want to do that. And the interesting feature is uh, the first one is uh, that is a declarative language. So it, is, uh, it leads to very conci concise and readable programs. And here is an example, a pretty standard example. So here we've got a definition of a problem that we want to achieve, in this case a factorial. And here we've got implementation that uh, is very close to the definition. And this is something that uh, I am very keen on <coughs> keeping when I develop systems, when I design systems. So I would like uh, that the code expresses uh, very much the definition of the problem. So that also uh, links to my kind of laziness in documenting the code. Because uh, if the code fits uh, uh, the definition uh, very tightly, there's less uh, need of uh, providing extra documentation. Because a developer that comes to that code can see clearly what it, was, what it was designed for, and make changes up on that. So if you want, I can uh, explain all this, uh, but perhaps I better leave it for a later stage. So here's another example for a quick sort. This is also something that is resolved uh, trivially in Erlang. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, list comprehensions. Raise your hands. Everyone. Cool. So I probably don't need to go into details here. So this, uh, uh, this is, a, is an operator that is used for the selection of uh, what comes out of tail. So there's a head <coughs> and tail. And, uh, a, and basically, there is a reordering uh, based on first plus head plus last, where last is what comes out of tail. Uh, with this uh, condition, with this clause. So,
also another interesting uh, uh, feature is the binary patterns. I use that quite extensively in, in combination with Haskell. Uh, I'm also co-founder of another uh, company focused on natural language processing and the core um, um, part of the system, the workers are developed in Haskell. And uh, I, I find it very nice to communicate uh, uh, via binaries between Haskell and Erlang, uh, via port. And uh, I come up with a similar sort of uh, pattern matching for um, Yes, for binary uh, communication. So, another feature that is interesting is that it's uh, um, designed for concurrency. So it's, uh, it uh, leads you to use uh, lightweight processes that are highly scalable. So this is an example of how we Spawn a process, pretty trivial. So from one uh, process we can use the call spawn to spawn an external process and we get back the uh, process ID of the process that was spawned and this is uh, valid within a, an Erlang VM but also with the uh, connected uh, Erlang VMs in a uh, fully meshed uh, sort of uh, cluster architecture. So uh, the process ID is uh, unique within that cluster. So the, the interesting part is uh, um, there's a lot of focus on message passing. So there's not externally shared state that needs to be locked. Uh, um, and this is the way you pass uh, data via that operator. And a receive will receive that data from the other side. It's robust. And I will explain now what that means. It's pretty much what led to the design of OTP, this sort of feature. So if we think about processes, there could be a number of processes and they can um, spawn with a spawn link uh, option, which uh, also establishes a link between the processes. What does that mean? It means that uh, when a process uh, terminates, an exit uh, signal is uh, uh, propagated to the rest of the connected uh, processes, so in this way, and uh, terminate, termination is propagated. So this uh, goes uh, pretty much with the philosophy of letting it crash, which is obviously not always desirable, but uh, I mean it's, uh, it leads you to the development of code that is less defensive. So when you are capable of restoring a processes, it doesn't really matter that much if it crashes once in a while, provided that you are capable of restoring the uh, initial state or, or a valid state that lets you carry on with your computation. So, so yeah, go ahead. Are you talking here about uh, exiting the process or crashing the process? Exiting. Okay. In fact, uh, this is an example of uh, trapping an exit. Before, all the processes were crashing. So in this case, this uh, process highlighted with the red is uh, capable of trapping an exit process. And in this case, the exit is trapped, uh, and an action can be tri triggered upon that. So, th which leads to the design pattern of uh, a supervision tree. So, supervisors are processes that uh, don't perform much computation, are just in charge of uh, restarting processes, <coughs> worker processes that are connected to it, or supervisors that are connected to it. So. The idea is to come up with a tree that gracefully retreats when, uh, when it faces an uh, unexpected scenario and it regenerates itself. So another interesting feature is a uh, uh, distributed uh, airline. Oh, what happened there? 
that was not what I want. Wow. I think there's some issue with the... Uh, luckily, here we go to a better stay. Okay, and um, distribution, uh, as I mentioned it briefly before, is uh, a feature that not only allows you to send messages within the same uh, Erlang runtime system, but uh, also across uh, runtime systems via the network. So there's uh, a bit of concern in terms of scalability of uh, a system designed that way, because uh, a fully meshed architecture can only scale up to a certain extent. So for that, uh, I suggest uh, a, a good book that uh, was released uh, recently, and I will give you information later. Uh, uh, written by Francesco Cesarini and is uh, uh, addressing precisely these issues, learning from the experience of WhatsApp and, uh, and also some, uh, um, some companies that run into this problem and resolved it. Uh, that said, there's uh, the desire to make it easy for everyone to come up with the scalability of WhatsApp. And, uh, also, this uh, leads to another question. Who needs it, such a high level of scalability? Well, at present, perhaps not that many, but we ought to think also of, about uh, uh, IoTs, Internet of Things, and uh, it's nice to have uh, processes handling the communication with lots of connected devices. So this is going to become a, a, a problem that many more are going to face in the future. So our goal is to make it easy for people to scale to that level. Another interesting feature, to be frank, I've uh, tried it, but I've not used it in production, is uh, the change, uh, the hot swap of code. This is uh, uh, really providing the zero downtime uh, sort of uh, version upgrade of a system. So the way it works, here is illustrated very sim in a simplified model. So we got a version one, and we got a process based on that version one. Similarly, we generate a version two. We can <coughs> load in the code. Even in a remote uh, uh, Erlang VM, we can put there the code, uh, compile it locally, and bring it up into the uh, memory of the VM, and then we can spawn processes based on that version. Not only, but we can migrate existing processes to that version as well, and phase out the old version. And Erlang has got a nice feature which also allows you to keep the state of a running process while it migrates. That might sound uh, difficult, and in fact it is. So, <laughs> so this is um, also uh, another interesting feature, which is uh, a multi-core support. Um, the, the main characteristic here is not uh, having a, a shared memory approach that simplifies the concurrency, and also the design pattern recommended by OTP and. Uh, uh, leads to the uh, simplified model of uh, uh, providing multi-core capabilities. So here we got uh, an Erlang VM with schedulers. Every process has got a running queue, and uh, the message is passed over this uh, running queue. One of the things that I faced uh, working with uh, uh, companies that use Erlang is that uh, if they don't use uh, OTP, uh, there are some circumstances in which uh, the message is not read by a queue, and it sits there in the queue, and it sits there forever, unless you are reading that particular message. So it's a good practice, if you want to go that way, to drain up the queues in some circumstances, just to prevent from this from happening. OTP saves you from this sort of danger, because it implements handlers that uh, automatically drain the queue. So here are the myths. I wrote my Erlang system in four weeks. Wow. That's uh, not really the case. So 
yeah, if someone claims to have done that, uh, the questions that come up naturally is, uh, is it documented? <coughs> Are the developers still supporting it? And uh, what uh, visibility does uh, the support have into what is going on inside the system? And this, there's a number of uh, metrics that could be extracted if things are uh, developed properly, if the system is maintained. And uh, this is something that uh, led us to the development of one of our internal products called Wombat OAM. It's uh, primarily focused on reading metrics and now is uh, uh, evolving into real-time data analytics of uh, metrics coming in and also with elements of uh, machine learning. So we want to build up on the know-how of how to handle these metrics. And uh, uh, yes, another question about this uh, is how much code was actually written because someone hooks in uh, libraries that don't really, they don't re really know much about and uh, they come up with a system, but uh, yeah, it doesn't uh, really mean much to achieve this. So upgrades, as I was saying before, during uh, runtime are easy. Ta-da, no. <laughs> so it is easy in some circumstances. For example, for simple patches, adding functionality without ch changing the state, which doesn't necessarily mean stateless processes. It might mean processes that uh, have a similar structure of the state, so that the state can be easily migrated from one process to another. It's like uh, having an API for a state. Um, if there are fundamental changes to the uh, state, it, it becomes more tricky. <coughs> so it's uh, generally mm, kind of dangerous in a live system to make upgrades that uh, have uh, heavy implications on a, on a state. <coughs> okay. So another myth is we have achieved that level of availability. <coughs> yeah, right. So this um, was a sentence uh, <coughs> yeah, that uh, is a quote uh, from uh, uh, Bert Nelson a director of uh, programming in uh, Ericsson. Uh, it says, uh, as a matter of fact, the network performance has been so reliable, there is almost a risk that our field engineers do not learn maintenance skills. And I faced something similar. I was working in uh, Sony Computer Entertainment for PlayStation 4, and I happened to lead the development team of uh, uh, Little Big Planet, one of the games. And uh, I used Erlang. And uh, I released uh, in production a system that uh, was never restarted for one year. So when I left the company, there was panic. I had to repeat the instruction on how to restart it because there was never the need to restart it, which, uh, which is something amazing. But it's, it's a different sort of problem to the one that is normally faced by uh, ops engineers <coughs> out there. So. And now we're stuck. Okay. So this is uh, more like it. Five nights. And But what is important to note is that uh, it's simpler to uh, reach uh, that level of availability. Yeah. Uh, by the way, all the things that I'm saying are doable with other languages, with other technologies. It's just a matter of how easy it is. Our goal is to make it easy. And uh, definitely there is uh, a fraction of the effort uh, involved into coding Erlang. Uh, upgrades, like I said before, are kind of risky. And uh, also a system can obviously be exposed to other risk, ex external risks. In the context of a, a cloud provider, there could be an instance uh, going to retirement or something like that, and hardware faults. So yeah, it's, uh, it's happening. There's a number of uh, companies that use. Uh, I mentioned before React. I mentioned also RabbitMQ. Mongoose IM is another one of our internal products. It's a 
scalable XMPP instant messaging server based on eJabbd. It, we haven't yet faced the challenge to scale it up to the level of WhatsApp, but we know how to do it. In fact, we also supported WhatsApp at an early stage, giving them consultancy about uh, the uh, initial coding infrastructure. Um, and primarily, I think it was related to um, Amnesia, which is an in a database that uh, Erlang has as part of uh, the Erlang distribution. Uh, React is, is very interesting, especially React Core, which I mentioned before. Um, I'm currently working for a product that is called Megalod. It's a load testing uh, framework that uh, uh, is supposed to ma uh, scale massively. Uh, supposed to means that I have not yet achieved that, but I'm working on it. And the idea is to have a cluster based on uh, React Core to uh, provide a feature for time series uh, uh, storage, and that is uh, aimed at storing metrics that are retrieved from the running load test for. Uh, web UIs to browse it afterwards for sharing in a collaborative fashion this data at a later stage. Uh, what's the difference <coughs> between React and CacheDB? Right. It's, uh, it's a different technology. CacheDB, uh, I'm not uh, particularly uh, so familiar with it, but it's a do document database as opposed, opposed to... Value. That's right, that's right. There are three main families, perhaps four, uh, there's a document-based family of databases. There's a column type of databases out there, uh, such as Cassandra or Bigtable. And there's a family of uh, uh, key-value stores, such as React. Uh, I think Dynamo is also implementing that. DynamoDB on uh, Amazon. And, uh, and also Redis that uh, implements it primarily in memory. Okay, uh, who is using it? Lots of companies out there. And lots of companies that we are not uh, aware of. For example, it's uh, very uh, uncommon that uh, um, a banking um, company like Goldman Sachs comes up and talks about their internal use of uh, these tools. So some of... Uh, some of these companies allowed us to disclose the information that they are using Erlang. Some others didn't. So there's a number of more companies that are using it and they don't want to show it. So for more information, there are a number of books. This is the one that I mentioned before. It's uh, quite recent. And it's got a focus on uh, how to scale it to a large uh, uh, amount of uh, boxes in a cluster. So there's also a number of other books out there, but uh, <coughs> what I what I really suggest if uh, is that if you are not familiar with the language, the best way to get uh, on with it is uh, to get some training, and we provide that. Uh, I learned uh, that lesson myself, uh, working in Sony, and it took me quite a while to mm, dig into code. I threw away twice my code before learning how to do it, before releasing it into production. And I think uh, a lot of this uh, effort could have been spared to me if I went to, into something I trained. So these are a number of addresses that you can reach out for more information about the language. And uh, yeah, that's about it. If you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer. Yeah. So, sorry. Does that actually work? Oh, OK. Wonderful. Good. And now I'll just talk loudly, seeing as we're in a small cinema. Um, yeah, I was just, you were talking about hot code load reloading yes. uh, for changing the, like, I guess, releasing a new version. But what I was thinking was 
people use hot code reloading as a, a way of fixing bugs in production systems? Um, that's in an interesting question. Yes, I, I came to use it okay. uh, when I was working in Sony, simply because it's an easy way to inject code, test it, but I was only using it uh, under test, not in production. And I wouldn't recommend it, <laughs> using it in production. But yes, uh, it could be OK, I just didn't know if it was a common thing that people did. Yes, okay. yes, it's very useful to use it that way. Mm -hmm. And there are two ways, actually. One is to uh, push the code remotely. And in fact, with this uh, Megalod tool that I discussed briefly before, uh, we, we provide the possibility of uh, defining your load test scripts in uh, uh, eScript, which is a favored uh, Erlang language that compiles against Beam, and also in Elixir. And by doing that, we push the code remotely, and we compile it remotely, and run it remotely. An alternative is to compile it locally. And if the version is the same, you can propagate it, <laughs> propagate just the beams, load in the beams. And that's an alternative way of doing it. There are two ways. Any other question? How secure is the, the hot uh, swapping of code? Or <coughs> the VM itself? Yeah. It's not. <coughs> Good point. No, it's, um, it's something that we have uh, spent some effort on uh, as part of uh, our um, engagement with uh, one of our customers, Infoblox in particular. Uh, I can talk about this because it's no secret. And this is going to be part of uh, new releases of Erlang. Uh, and is the ability to communicate over TLS channels. So that gives an extra degree of uh, uh, security that is kind of obvious, but the security is a very wide uh, topic to consider. So there's security of that level, communication level security. There's uh, security about having signed code to be loaded into the VM. And there's also security that goes beyond that, we, and in this case, we are talking about operational security as well as information technology provided security. So you have to think uh, about it as an upfront solution to security and instead an operational security, which also involves uh, humans, involves uh, uh, reading of metrics because uh, a system could be under denial of service attacks and uh, its state could be uh, altered to ad the advantage of an attacker, for instance. And that's another level of security. And we are also exploring that side of it. And it's, uh, it's very much linked uh, also to the adaptability. So we, we would like our tools to automatically adapt to changing scenarios, to design for the unexpected somehow. Anything else? Well, like kind of libraries and that kind of thing, what sort of third party libraries support is there? There's a number of uh, libraries that uh, Erlang Solution provides. There's uh, a number of other organizations. I, I would say that uh, primarily is, uh, oops, primarily is. Uh, Okay, um, Erlang Solutions and Basher that release a lot of uh, useful libraries for uh, the Erlang community. But Who? Basher. Basher is the uh, company behind React. So, for example, if you think about Rebar, Rebar is a tool that they originally developed. And now, presumably, it's independent. I'm not sure about it. Um, another interesting effort that I want to mention, okay, is that uh, um, we are supporting also RabbitMQ. We are supporting v Pivotal. So Pivotal reached out to us to release the patches and next features of uh, uh, RabbitMQ. So pretty much uh, 
we are half and half split into uh, supporting the incoming calls for <coughs> Rob and you. Cool, I think uh, I finished early. Cheers.